Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, this is Ray Gerard. Welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. This is uh, the program that asks, what if St. Paul were alive today? What if he were here to write a letter to America? What would he say? Well, on this program, we give you precisely such a letter. Uh, and in addition, we also um, talk about two things people say, often never to talk about at the same time, religion and politics. But we do this uh, with the idea that uh, politics and social affairs, uh, the national affairs, of a country, community affairs, of any uh, small municipality, any community, needs to take into account uh, religious uh, principles, religious truths. There are certain things that are in fact true, that religion provides us key insights to. And if we don't bear those in mind, we run the risk of falling seriously astray. And as we go about and engage in this discussion, we do so with a certain motto in mind, love and kindness through the light of truth. Today's letter, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, to all the holy ones in Christ Jesus who are in the United States, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority opposes what God has appointed, and those who oppose it will bring judgment upon themselves. Pay to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, toll to whom toll is due, Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance, He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So then, my beloved, do everything without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish. Now today, we took a little bit more liberty with the writings of Paul than we normally do. Uh... This is, in fact, a combination, which you just heard is, in fact, a combination of excerpts from two of his letters, one to the Romans and one to the Philippians. And, of course, we inserted the name uh, the United States in the greeting. Uh, But the principles that are in this letter, combined as they are, are particularly relevant for our discussion today, and they are consistent recurring principles in Paul's writings. First, the idea that um, there is authority that comes um, from God. There is, there is authority to be found in the human world around us, uh, whether they are governmental officials or other officials, and that the world around us is not to be resisted or fought or denied, but the people who have such positions of authority are to be respected because, in fact, um, the uh, person who is a follower of Christ is at peace with the world around him. He recognizes that all things are in the hand of God and that 
if there is to be trouble or strife, uh, often enough it comes, uh, well, it starts in his own mind. And that if everybody uh, maintained this Christian attitude of being peace with the things that were around them, uh, that we would have uh, less, if any, strife at all among all of us in society. So that's first and foremost. There is authority, and it is to be respected. Paul talks about this often enough. He talks about slaves being um, obedient to your masters, and he talks about this uh, in multiple places, and he calls himself a slave as well. Uh, he also um, he also mentions, well, also the the principle that's important to note here is one of obedience. So if we're supposed to respect these authorities, we are also supposed to be obedient. Obedient to the authorities as we are obedient to God. That we, when we're respecting authorities and becoming obedient to those who are superior to us, um, we are being obedient to God. We're really doing things for the sake of God because we're not trying to stir up turmoil or friction. That would be contrary to the will of God. So to serve God, we in fact uh, obey uh, the superiors above us. Also, um, not only do we just simply obey, but we do it without grumbling, without complaining, so that we are without blemish. It is in fact a blemish on us if we complain and we gripe. Why? Well, for one reason, because we don't really then believe fully in God. Otherwise, we would have the peace that we talked about earlier. A true follower of Christ respects authority in, a, shall we say, a saintly fashion. The saints all exhibited this type of quality. They didn't get bothered by people with authority above them. My, one of my favorite stories about Padre Pio, I don't know if I, uh, I may have um, you know, discussed this one on this program before, but I think not. In any event, one of my favorite stories about Padre Pio does not involve one of his many miracles. And and lo, he had, um, I mean, Lord knows he had, you know, it's hard to count, uh, hundreds, thousands. Um, but in any event, one of my favorite stories involves obedience. Uh, Padre Pio uh, encountered or, or uh, he uh he uh, he uh, well, he got the stigmata in 1918 and had the stigmata for 50 years. Painful, visible, um, notable to people around him, even though he tried to hide it. And some people accused him of trying to fake it. And he he uh, he incurred quite quite a following uh, in his part uh, of Italy, and so much so that other People got jealous of it. Rumors got back to Rome that perhaps he was faking things, that perhaps he was trying to uh, start a following, a cult of his own, and he fell under suspicion. And at one point, uh, the word came down from the Vatican that Padre Pio was to be transferred. The idea was that if he was transferred out of his home territory, I think the idea was to go to a place which is about 300 miles away, uh, but to take him out of the, the region in which the people knew him, that this would, uh, you know, this would stop this whole faction from growing. In any event, uh, an emissary was sent from Rome down to San Giovanni Rotundo, where uh, he was, uh, where he was a priest. And uh, this emissary arrived late at night. I think it was about eleven o'clock at night or midnight. And uh, Padre Pio was sent for, and uh, so he came and he met this emissary. And the emissary announced uh, what his mission was. And Padre Pio immediately said, good, let's go. And uh, this Vatican representative said, well, you don't mean now, it's midnight. And the response from Padre Pio was, well, yes. If the Pope has ordered this, then we do it. Let's, uh, let's do it now. Instantly, this emissary uh, said, that he, he said that instantly he realized Everything he'd heard about Padre Pio, that he was a man of ego, he was a man of arrogance, that he was a man of trying to build, like I said, his own faction for himself. Instantly he realized it wasn't true. Why? Because he was obedient. And why was he obedient? 
because Padre Pio always had his mind set on something higher, like Paul. He always had a view towards God. The things of this world did not disrupt, disrupt the peace that he had, knowing that there was a God who loved him. Now, having discussed all of that, the virtue of recognizing authority, the virtue of being obedient, what are we going to talk about today? Something that just recently has made big news involves a high school in the Indianapolis uh, area. It's called Bray Booth, uh, Catholic, uh Catholic High School, although I don't believe it's, I don't think it's right to call it Bray Booth Catholic High School anymore, and I'll explain why. It's a Jesuit institution. Uh, I went to a Jesuit high school, as a matter of fact. I went to a Jesuit college as well. And um, there are about 750 students in the Indianapolis area who go to this uh, Jesuit high school. And uh, for two years, for two years, uh, they have had a teacher. It does not teach religion. I think teaches history or some other subject. I'm not sure which, but not religion. In any event, a teacher who is uh, gay. He has, I believe, engaged in a civil marriage, and uh, he has announced uh, his situation on uh, social media. It's become widely known to the public, and so it is now out there. And the position of the church, often enough, is that uh, most akin, something akin to, I suppose, what uh, used to be the case in the armed forces, where you know, I don't, you know, don't ask, don't tell, kind of a thing, and um, uh, it has been, you know, the position of many uh, school districts and you know, Catholic school districts and such that um, if someone wants to have, you know, a sexual orientation of that nature, that's, you know, that's that's a personal matter, but once it affects uh, school affairs, once it affects school matters. Once it becomes public and then all the students know about it, then that's a different matter and that has to be addressed. And the archdiocese for two years has been trying to tell the, uh, the high school, this is admitted by the high school, uh, has been telling the high school not to renew the contract of this particular teacher because of the scandalous effect that it has. And for two years, the high school has refused. And so now the Archdiocese has um, issued a decree, a formal decree, saying that regrettably, Brebeuf Jesuit Jesuit Preparatory School has freely chosen not to enter into such agreements that protect the important ministry of communicating the fullness of Catholic teaching to students. Therefore, Brebeuf Jesuit Preparatory School will no longer be recognized as a Catholic institution. What are they talking about when they talk about agreements? They're talking about employment contracts. And what, what, what are they asking for these employment contracts to say? And this is a common feature uh, for uh, contracts with uh, teachers in Catholic institution, educational t- institutions all across the country. And what it, uh, the provision that the Archdiocese has asked for is one that says, that you will, if you are employed uh, by this Catholic school, you will uh, abide by uh, or, or, or teach or you will respect, honor, display uh, fundamental Catholic principles. In other words, you will not defy fundamental Catholic principles. Now, it's possible, that depending on how that uh, such a clause is worded, that just being engaged in a same-sex relationship could be uh, perceived as a violation of the contract. But primarily, uh, from my understanding, schools don't enforce uh, provisions of that sort in that way. Again, don't ask, don't tell. But if it becomes public, if you post something on social media yourself to make it public, this is a different matter. Why? Why is that? Well, it's it's very simple. It's the role model effect. It's 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 the it's the um, it's the aspect of leading uh, of potentially confusing others about moral principles. 
uh, Jesus himself. I mean, if, if we're going to be Catholic, we have to, at a minimum, at a minimum, accept the Gospels, accept what Christ said. If we do not accept what Christ said, how in the world uh, can anyone uh, you know, claim to be Catholic? In any event, uh, Christ himself said, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Now in the notes, this is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 18, and if you go to the notes, if you look up uh, this particular uh, section of the Bible on the U.S. CCB, the U.S. Conference of Catholic uh, Bishops website, and you find the notes uh, to this uh, translation of the Bible. It's the New American Bible Revised Edition. If you look to the notes, what it uh, what it will tell you is that in those days, observant Jews uh, avoided the company of Gentiles and tax collectors. So uh, such a one is to be set to the outside. So Jesus is saying that if someone refuses to abide by uh, what is required by the church, such a one is to, in effect, be put into exile, be put outside uh, the circle of the faithful. Paul himself said something similar. First letter to the Corinthians. He was referring to a person uh, who was living with his father's wife. He said that he called this immorality of a kind that's not even found among pagans. And he says, are you inflated with pride? Should you not rather have been sorrowful? The one who did this should be expelled. He says that you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now, how can someone be delivered to Satan and yet saved on the day of the Lord? Well, easy enough. The followers of Christ were the saved. Those who did not believe in Christ are the ones who are in the company of of Satan. So if you're going to deliver someone into the hands of Satan, you're delivering him to the ungodly, delivering him to um, you know those people who don't believe in Christ. And why? Why does Jesus say this? Why does Paul say this? Why expel people? Well, Paul says it so that his spirit may be saved. And that has been the uh, interpretation and the policy of the Catholic Church for example, even with regard to something as strong as excommunication, why does the church impose such penalties? Well, all the idea is simple, to try to save a person, to try to bring a person around, to try to convince them of their wrongdoing. I mean, why? I mean, because if, in fact, the church does not stand up for what it regards as wrong, then where does that lead? Where does that go? All kinds of things then might be accepted. There will be such tremendous gray area. That has been the strength, the soul, the spirit of the church. That has been its its you know shining feature for over two millennia. The fact that it does not bend to the whims of a given age. That it does not bend to specific interpretations of specific people at one point or another. The church has developed its magisterium. The church has developed its teachings uh, through councils, through studies, through uh, you know, uh, conferences of, of, of theologians and priests all getting together, debating these things. You just take a look at the Second Vatican Council, for example. For years, bishops from all over the world came together because there were questions about uh, church policies, church teachings, and how they should be, uh, you know, how they should be presented in the modern era. 
And it has been said and maintained that Vatican II did not change fundamental church teachings or beliefs about anything, but that it changed the way that it was presented. And this has to be true. The church cannot change these principal elements of the faith because as this whole show is based on, there is this idea that the scriptures, the words of Christ, our faith, contains things that are true. There are things that are everlasting. They don't change over time. If not, we can be lost. We can be set adrift. So this is this is what's to be maintained here, the idea that uh, you need to set people into exile as a last resort if they refuse to change their ways. And why would that be? Well, we... Well, one reason, as we already discussed, is, in fact, to help that person. What's another? To help those in the church community. To help those who are left inside. If a person refuses church teaching on something and goes about and continues to practice it regardless, and he remains inside the community, he may affect others. And then what? Well, the, the gospel, I mean, Christ himself has said, and especially with regard to children, and this is what we're talking about in a school setting, someone who causes another person to sin, someone who leads, for example, children, little ones, into sin, it would be better if they had a millstone tied around their neck and cast into the sea. Uh, the idea, you know, this is this is fundamental. This is extremely important. We have to protect others from these false ideas. Um, I mean, the whole idea of sin in and of itself has to be recognized. In our culture today, we don't do that. You know, we, I mean, just the most fundamental sin you can imagine, killing. Our culture has cheapened that. We have now abortion laws that have been around for 40, 50 years, and we have people openly talking about killing, like the governor of Virginia, killing, or as laws, I believe New York provide, New York law provides this, other states may provide this, uh, allowing babies that are born to die. The governor of Virginia talked about, you know, either allowing or uh, making a child that has survived an abortion die. Once Lines get blurred. It's natural for people to slide down a slippery slope and go farther and farther in the wrong direction. That's what we are seeing happen with this most fundamental concept of not killing. That's what we're seeing in the arena of abortion. Well, we're seeing it also in the attacks on the family. We had contraception so that um, men and women could, um, you know, have sexual relations without um, having to have it tied to the idea of procreation, without having it tied to, uh, uh, you know, a spiritual God-oriented purpose. Uh, we see it with uh, cohabitation, people living together. That came of age back in the 60s. And now, who even talks about that as a sin anymore? What you have is the one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. And then what happens? We have people living together to the point now. Who, talk, who talks about that now as a sin? But is it? Is it? Well, if we don't think so, then we have to say that we don't think the Ten Commandments are correct. Christ talked about adultery. And if we don't think it's wrong, we have to say that Christ was wrong. You know, we everything starts, everything we hold there, everything we believe will start to unravel. Christ talked about adultery. He said, you know, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, obviously, one of the commandments. Um, but he said, look, I, I tell you, if you look, if a man looks at another woman with lust, and he's committed adultery of the heart. So that's wrong. That's wrong. 
Um, so obviously, if adultery of the heart is wrong, then actual physical uh, adultery also, logically, <laughs> obviously, is wrong. Adultery is wrong. Well, if adultery, you know, man and woman, um, if a man and woman is wrong, then what about uh, sexual relations? Or how, how about a man looking at another man with lust in his heart? It's outside the bounds of marriage, is it not? Or is it? Nowadays, that's the whole idea. People want to make that type of marriage legal. You know, but that's never been the case for hundreds of years that that's been, you know, considered by society at large to be to be true. Um, you know, Christ himself, in re- answer to a question about divorce, said, what did he say? He said, man and woman, or, or is it male and female, depending on your translation. Male and female, he created them. In regard to a question on divorce, male and female, he created them. A marriage is to be between a man and a woman. It's the natural thing. Christ was saying this was the order established by God. We are... uh, we are at risk of trying to rewrite these things. So, you know, is it better to have a society where... I mean, also, and, and critics of, of, of schools uh, rightly point out that Catholic schools don't enforce these employment contract clauses that I talked about with regard to people who may be living together, people who may be committing adultery. There is, there is validity in that type of criticism. But the point is, um, even if we're deficient in enforcing our standing up for one thing as being wrong, that's no justification for saying that we should also be deficient in standing up for something else being wrong. If these things are wrong, if the, if it is true, in fact, that this is wrong. And if we say it's not, if we say it's not, if we redefine marriage, We are going against uh, all of these things that we talked about. We're going against what St. Paul, uh, St. John Paul, Pope St. John Paul II called the theology of the body. The fact that Christ himself referred to the fact that male and female, he created them. This is the natural order. We slide down a tremendous slippery slope and it will not be good. Is there a sin? Is this a sin? And it, I mean, the first question is, is there sin? We don't even talk about sin very much anymore as a culture. We don't like to talk about sin very much as a culture. We don't like, to, we believe everybody's going to be saved. No one has, you don't have to confess your sins. Uh, many people believe that. Many people who used to be Catholic uh, don't believe, you know, in the need for confession. Um, this is a tremendous slippery Slope. Is there sin? Is it not important? Is it not real? Well, if it's not real, then why did Christ even come? There's only one reason he came. It's for the forgiveness of sins. There's one reason for his sacrifice, for the forgiveness of sin. Sin is real. Sin needs to be worried about. We need to try, at least, to avoid it. Well, in any event, um, this is um, this is the situation we're faced with, where one particular Catholic high school has now decided that, contrary to the authority of the church, um, they will not enforce, or they will not require their contracts to say, or will not enforce provisions in the contracts that say. Uh, you cannot um, violate fundamental church teachings in a public way. How can you be called Catholic if you are sponsoring or approving people who are fundam- violating fundamental church teaching uh, in a public way? Do they believe in it or not? You know, one of the whole principles of being Catholic is, you know, faith is not just simply saying, I believe. It's saying, I believe, and then if you are honest about it, 
you live according to those beliefs. Because if you don't, how can you really say you believe? How can you really say these things are true? If sin is real, we would be, and and we believe it, we, we understand, we, in our heart, believe it is wrong, and it is an offense against God Almighty. If we really took that to heart with all of its implications and consequences, we would be so aghast at the prospect of even the smallest venial sin. This is what the saints talk about, this, this kind of, uh, this kind of abhorrence for sin. Uh, that, you know, we would have we would have such a an aversion to even the smallest sin uh, that we would run from it as fast as we could. And here we've got a Catholic high school that says otherwise. Or do they? There are statements by uh, authorities for the school that try to make the case. That all we're really talking about is an intrusion into internal church and po- internal school policy, hiring and firing decisions, and that the archbishop and the archdiocese should not go there. Um, but is it so? Is the question so easily avoided? Is it not really when it, when you come down to it, a question as to whether or not? Adultery of this sort, man with a man with a man, um, is a sin. Is it adultery? Is not a marriage between a man and a man appropriate? Is that that the question? It has to be at its core the question. It cannot be avoided so simply by saying, "Oh, this is just a hiring and firing decision." No, it's a hiring and firing decision about a fundamental church teaching. And if you believe that. Teachers are role models for kids. Teachers are uh, an influence on kids. They create impressions on children who are open to all kinds of ideas. They're they're vulnerable, uh, especially at the teenage years when they're just starting to really think for themselves. Uh, if we don't think these 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 teachers, these adults who spend so much time with the children, have influences on them, we're sadly mistaken. You see it all the time. Take, for example, the case of a bad influence. How often have you heard of a situation where somebody uh, is an alcoholic and they have a child who is also an alcoholic? Is it um, is it simply genetic? Does it get pe- is is um, is the entirety of the reason a child becomes uh, an alcoholic genetic? Is it perhaps also uh, the fact that they don't over, if they have some genetic predisposition to it, that they don't do enough to overcome that, don't seek enough help? Is that part of this? Even a bad influence, is it not a part of it? Of course it's a part of it. Even a bad influence can have an effect. You take an abusive parent, someone who abuses uh, his children or his wife, um, a lot of times a child will end up being an abuser of the same nature. Why is that? Why is that? I know something about this. I had a father who was an alcoholic, and then I had an older brother who was also an alcoholic and died at a very young age from it. He was only 29. And he died from cirrhosis of the liver at that young age. Why is that? When we were children growing up, there was nothing, nothing that we wanted to avoid more than being like our father. There was nothing we perceived as, uh, you know, ardently as um, as the harm, the hurt that was being caused by the things that our father did. And yet, even though he was part of that understanding, even though he was he even though he he understood how how you know how important it was to avoid being like our father he couldn't avoid it fell into it why you know we have weaknesses and we can't cope with our problems we fall prey to dealing with them in some other way i think that was true for my father i think that was true for my older brother now, if my father had set a different example, 
even if my brother had some genetic predisposition to alcohol, would he have died from cirrhosis of the liver at age 29? Would he have fallen that fast, that easily? Bad examples, even bad ones, can have a tremendous effect. And so, should good ones not also have a positive effect? Of course, there are influences. And teachers, likewise, have an influence. This really is just common sense. It's just common sense. So when a school says, well, you know, I really want to respect this teacher. Uh, there was a statement that was released uh, by the uh, provincial for the uh, Jesuit order. The Brave High School is affiliated with uh, the Midwest. Uh, there's a, a Midwest uh, branch of uh, the uh, Society of Jesus uh, that is responsible for this school and, and others. And the provincial uh, for uh, that organization said that uh, Bray Booth Jesuit, with my support as provincial, respects the primacy of an informed conscience of members of its community when making moral decisions. We recognize that at times some people who are associated with our mission make personal moral decisions at variance with church doctrine. We do our best to help them grow in holiness, all of us being loved sinners, loved sinners who desire to follow Jesus. Very Catholic uh, in many ways, um, very uh, honorable, very respectable in many ways. You try to help the sinner. Of course, that is a Christian belief. But what he says is this. We respect the primacy of an informed conscience of members of its community. The primacy. Well, insofar as that talks about respecting the free will of other people so that we don't, we can't force them to do something, uh, that their decisions are decisions between them and God, all well and good. If we interpret primacy to extend beyond the individual person involved, to also encompass its effect on people around them. Uh, that's something totally different. Primacy, primacy of an informed conscience, primacy. And there's, you can also question the idea of an informed, a truly informed conscience, but without even discussing that, this whole world word primacy uh, it just seems that there's too much reliance on that. Well, this person has a right to live their life the way they want to, and they can be part of a school community as a teacher. We ignore, we ignore multiple principles. If we, if we maintain that, we ignore what St. Paul talked about as the need to respect authority. We ignore Christ who says, if someone refuses to abide by the uh, requirements of the church, then he is to be expelled, cast out. Why? For the benefit of those around him so that he doesn't poison the barrel of apples, so to speak. Um, you know, we, we um, to maintain that position as the provincial does, you have to maintain that you are not going to be obedient to a superior authority, contrary to the writings of, of St. Paul if he's a saint, if he expressed things that are true, isn't this not also true? What happens if we don't do this sort of thing? As I said, this was all very spiritual for Paul. It was reflecting a peace. It was, it was honoring God to obey authorities. Um, this was all very... It was... When Paul says without a blemish, if you do this, you should do this so that you will not have blemish. What kind of blemish? A blemish on your soul. Not respecting an authority is sinful. If the provincial, the Jesuits in the Midwest, if the high school believed homosexual marriage uh, should be allowed, 
that it's really not sinful, then they should approach the church with that. Make the case inside the church. Ask for the, seek to have the church teaching changed. If you cannot, then perhaps you are not right. If you cannot, perhaps the majority of, of others in the church uh, believe otherwise. I know, I know people like to cite a lot of polls about what a majority of Catholics think. Well, you know, polls uh, can be all you know framed in such a way that you know that they're not accurate. Uh, this was admitted in the abortion context uh, by one of the co-founders of, of NARAL, who said they simply lied about polls to inflate at the time um, that, a, that Roe versus Wade was uh, in, its, in its inception in the years immediately preceding it. You know, they, they wanted to change the culture. They wanted to change society. They wanted to change the view in the country to abortion. They simply, they simply lied about the polls of Catholics. Um, and, you know, p- polls themselves uh, are never, never uh, the basis for determining what is true. If there are things that are true, um, then they're true in an objective sense because they come from God who is the one thing that never changes over time. He is truth. Um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the life. Um, uh, <laughs> polls are not are not the answer. Are these things true or are they not true? If you cannot get the church to agree with you that homosexual marriage is not sinful, then you obey the church. You respect the authority. Um, otherwise, you create schism in the church, and that is exactly, exactly what we are seeing. There's a article by a woman in the Indianapolis uh, local Indianapolis newspaper, the Indianapolis Star, and she says that the church, in regard to this uh, story with Bray Booth High School, she says that the Archdiocese of Indianapolis is propagating hate and homophobia. And she refers to the church church's bigoted treatment of the LGB2 community. She claims that she was raised in the Catholic Church, went to Catholic school for 12 years, and she is uh, sad and she is disappointed that the church has refused to evolve. Later on in this uh, opinion piece that she writes in the Indianapolis Star, she says that she is, in fact, no longer a practicing Catholic, that she disagrees with many fundamental uh, church uh, well, I don't know about fundamental, but agrees, disagrees with many uh, church teachings. But this is what we have. We have people saying that they're no longer Catholic because the church refuses to evolve. They're creating schism. They're splitting more and more people apart. The second largest community of believers in the U.S. is people who are ex-Catholics. A story like Bray Booth High School, the decision made by the decision makers for Bray Booth High School, is going to spur, uh, promote, uh, accelerate that process. It's going to cause other people to perhaps, perhaps, and and contribute perhaps to them leaving the church. This is the problem with not respecting church authorities. It is the problem of the effect on those around the particular individual involved. This all starts with one teacher at one high school, but it can spread and have a much wider effect. Um, you can look at the statements that are issued uh, by the people involved. We mentioned one by the Provincial for the Jesuits, another one. Uh, this is a statement that was released by the Board of Trustees uh, for the high school. It includes, um, it is signed uh, by the president of the high school, who is a Jesuit, who was a, um, maybe a Jesuit, probably a Jesuit, but he's a priest. And um, he tries to make the case that this is only about the hiring and firing decisions. Um, you know, without discussing, the statement doesn't discuss at all the rightness or wrongness of a same-sex marriage. How can you take a position, this is a multi, it's like a three or four page uh, statement, how can you discuss this issue without discussing 
the central point of the issue. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it correct for the church to believe it does? If it is, then how can you, you know, then does the church have a right to insist that a fundamental teaching be be followed? If not, can you be called Catholic? It all starts, all of this, this whole thing that unfolds, this whole chain of consequences that unfolds after this, about whether or not they have the right to be called, to bear the name Catholic, all of it stems from the beginning point, which is, is this right or is this wrong? The statement avoids that. Um, they talk about the harm that this is causing to the teachers and the staffs. So and now we're accusing the church of creating harm. Um, again, uh, the schismatic effect. Um, the letter talks about, the statement talks about um, that the Jesuits are the largest order of men in the Catholic Church and that the position being taken by the high school as the support of the USA Midwest province of the Jesuits. Um, and that while they appreciate the standing uh, of the Archbishop uh, on, uh, on his moral beliefs, um, that, they're never, that they nevertheless take the position that they do. So what do we have? We have it is not enough to simply appreciate the position of the bishop. He is the bishop. He is um, an authority. He has certain rights that supersede those of the provincials of the Midwest Society of Jesus, at least in his diocese. That is the canon law of the Catholic Church. We're talking about whether or not you should be called Catholic. And there is, of course, great value in being called Catholic. It is the unity that people, it is the idea that there's a unity of belief for over a billion people all over the world. But we're disrupting that. There is great value in that. People talk about, you know, brand names. Uh, lawsuits are frequently uh, started because someone's infringing on someone's brand name. They're using their logo. They're, you know, confusing the the public with regard to, you know, their corporate identity, their business identity. There is value in a brand name. Uh, people on the internet, you know, you try to establish. To, people talk about branding themselves. There is great value in a brand. Well, the Catholic Church has value in its brand, which is it's universal. It stands for things that are true and that are understood by over a billion people the world over. This diminishes the value of that. And therefore, for that reason, in and of itself, this is wrong. There is, um, there is a correctness in being obedient there was a correctness in believing that there was a morality that comes from God and not what we think in our given uh, circumstances and in our given times. There, um, the whole idea that morality and these types of questions can be subject to subject subject to subjective interpretation that they're uh, that can be seen by different people in different times and in different ways. That is what has been um, what the church has fought against and stood like a strong pillar against for centuries. It, it, it began, uh, you know, with the so-called, and even before, but uh, certainly uh, progressed in the so-called Enlightenment, uh, where, you know, now for the first time, it's like it's all about the human person, the human uh, right to decide what is right and wrong, it's uh, the elevation of the human person. It's um, less of a concern with God. It's, it's, it's a lesser concern with looking towards God. It's prideful. And there's certainly pride involved um, in what uh, the high school and the Jesuit community uh, that governs this high school is doing. If they were truly humble, they would say, well, we don't agree with this but we will follow it. And doesn't that set a good example? We don't agree, but we will follow. Christ was obedient even to death on a cross. What did he say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Okay, Lord, please, if this cup may pass from me, 
let it pass. But, but, not my will, but yours. I, when we started this program, I, you know, sort of jerry-rigged together pieces of, of St. Paul's writings to come up with a particular letter, and I felt it important to include that segment from one of his letters where he talks about Christ being obedient to death on a cross for precisely this reason. It is a stellar mark of humility to say, look, I don't want this, but I will obey. That is Christian. It is the example Christ gave us in his ultimate sacrifice. How can we say we are following the example of Christ? How can we say we are picking up our cross and bearing it if we refuse to do those things that we would rather not do? Um, also, for example, the president of, of the, excuse me, the principal of the high school gave an interview. Uh, there are many parts of it that we could discuss. Uh, our time is running a little short, so we won't be able to do all of that. But, um, you know, he talks about uh, that they feel that people from many walks of life, whether Catholic or non-Catholic, a diverse set of people, can come and carry out our mission with effectiveness and with care, with the kind of work that we expect our faculty to do with our students, that many people from different backgrounds can do that. I think that's where the disagreement lies. Well, there, again, is uh, truth in what he says to a point. Is it true that people, whether Catholic or non-Catholic, can help fulfill their mission? Of course. Of course, many people can come in and teach uh, course material properly. Uh, many people can come in and um, do things that are not contrary to church teachings, even if they don't personally believe in them. But this is where this to a point comes in. If they don't believe in Catholic teaching and then publicly say, and this is you know, what you're doing when you post on social media that you have civilly, civilly been married um, or that you have some same-sex relationship, if you make that public, you are saying, I don't, I don't believe, and you're making that public. So now how can a person help fulfill the Catholic mission if they do that. Would it be okay if we had a teacher at that high school who was an atheist? Would that, I mean, if he, you know, and teaches the, he teaches the course material, he's a good person, doesn't go around, you know, assaulting people um, or committing other kinds of, you know, crime or, you know, I mean, he's a good person, but he's an atheist. Will that kind of person uh, be able to help fulfill your Catholic mission? What about um, what about a Satanist? What about a devil worshiper? Should he be allowed to be a teacher? And what if he openly proclaims that he's a Satan worshiper and the school hires him and the school says you can teach our students? What are the students to think? Is there not going to be some blurring of the lines? Well, you know, maybe Satan worshiping. You know, there are there are points at which um, you know, this can be carried too far. Now, many people may say, well, of course this is true, that, you know, you wouldn't allow a Satan worshiper or an, or an atheist. But maybe there's some other people who wouldn't, who would think that, sure, those people, but they, you know, they can they can feel what they do personally and still fulfill the mission. Could, would they say they can still believe what they do publicly and still fulfill the mission? This is what we're talking about. There has to be a point. You cannot just, there has to be a point where you're, you know, you draw a line. This cannot simply be a hiring and a firing decision. And so then you have to discuss, is a same-sex marriage uh, one of those dividing lines, whether it is so wrong that it constitutes a dividing line? Is it like Satan worship? Is it less than Satan worship? If it's less than Satan worship, how less than Satan worship? Is it right? Is it, is it even wrong in the first place? Maybe it's, maybe it's perfectly right. You have to have the discussion. To avoid that discussion is illogical. Um, if, you know, let's see. Um, oh, yes. Um, you know, 
again, there are many there are other points uh, in his uh, statement that we could discuss, but just one more. Uh, he talks about the fact that um, all of our programming, even though they're going to lose the designation of Catholic from the Archdiocese, he says that all of our programming will remain unchanged. There are some things we're going to miss, but it's not things that students and families will notice. So, now you're called Brebeuf High School instead of Brebeuf uh, Catholic High School. And I don't know if that's the name they use, but let's just say that it is. I mean, I'm, I'm sure in some regards they, they've got to use the name Catholic, uh, use the designation Catholic, at least in some respects, uh, and now they won't be able to. So, uh, just for the sake of this discussion, let's just um, uh, talk about it in terms of their name. Brebeuf High School, not Brebeuf Catholic High School. Well, people people won't even notice that. Is there nothing important about being called Catholic? Is it to be part of the church established by Christ or not? Is that not important? Uh, it's, uh, it's it's you know it's it's just another indication of once. You know, once we stray, all these other things. You know, how many different principles can we violate? Respect for authority, uh, o- obedience. Um, you know, and now not even um, you know recognizing the importance of of being part of the Catholic Church. And of course, the national media picked up this story: CBS, the New York Times, NBC, all of it. And all of this has an effect, as I say. Um, on the national community of, of Catholics. It's a sad situation. People are uh, honestly divided over this. They mean well. Uh, they're all well-intentioned, but they're divided. And when they're divided, it's a simple thing that we must not lose sight of, that we have to respect the authority. We have to obey. We have to say, I don't agree but I will follow. That is following the example of Christ. That is what St. Paul told us and what he would tell us today, still, if he could write a letter to us such as the one that um, we suggested at the start of this program. Um, We need to pray uh, for the people at that high school, all the people that are affected by it, and the church as a whole, these are indeed challenging times. We hope um, that uh, you will uh, uh, you will look to the writings of St. Paul for help in uh, your own uh, thinking on certain things. We hope that you will uh, we hope that you enjoyed this program, and we hope that you will um, join us again for another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. Thank you. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.